delegates and authors. Uh, it's, uh, most, most of the things have been, that have been said have actually bordered on what I want to say. And, uh, Rick also uh, has said quite clearly uh, that uh, 1717 was a, a, a day. And I agree with that. The problem that he had, in as much as I, as I could see, is that there were only four lodges to start with. And only three of those had members from other lodges in it which means that, uh, in fact, there's a fourth somewhere which we don't know about. Now, when you've ever tried to amalgamate anything between lodges, you'll find out that it's extremely difficult to do it. In order to get people to, to collaborate, it's quite difficult. And I believe that they did, in fact, start in 1717 by having a little get-together. And that get-together had possibilities. And in those possibilities it eventually evolved that people were prepared to give up being the head of a lodge and become a somewhat lesser head of some other organisation. And I believe that took time. And I also believe that it took time to actually understand, somebody to realise just what the potential was. Now, who was there amongst them that was really ambitious enough to really want to exploit it? Certainly, Sayer and so on were not. But Desert Goulier was an extremely ambitious man and a very, very clever man. And he was working for Montague as a consultant and as an engineer and for others as engineers, and they were trying to make their way. Montague wasn't that well off. If you read the history of it, he wasn't that well off and he'd made mistakes in the, in, the East, in the West Indies. And so, in other words, he was not a very rich man. But nonetheless, he was always looking for some new initiative. And he employed Desgoulier to actually investigate things like uh, inoculations in Africa and so on in order to ex uh, exploit the slave trade and other aspects of his uh, African venture. I believe that as time went on, this expanded. You must remember that in London at that time, there was well over 500 clubs or, or things of that nature. Certainly societies had their masters and their wardens, and I dare say they called them grand at times. And as time went on, and we just heard Pro Tem, for that night, he would be the grandmaster. So in other words, it was a culture, having a master and wardens and grand, grand, grandmasters on occasions and having masters most certainly. And then we get towards around about 17, 18, 19, and then we suddenly realise that Desert Goulier has a little plan in view. He knows full well that if he can only get aristocracy rubbing shoulders with the lesserlings in these smaller lodges, let's face it, there was that many. I mean, we know that when Grand Lodges formed, there was well over 200 lodges and that formed that. And in fact, well, there were all those that didn't join and those that didn't register necessarily. So in other words, there's a great deal of them. And most of them met in pubs, rather like their darts team and everything else. So in other words, there's a whole variation in, in calibre. And there were no doubt some lodges that were big and had influential people in them. Now... We get towards 1720, 1719, and Desigoulier realises, if only I can create a situation where everybody will really want to join, then I have a, a means of actually getting something greater out of that. He was still a lesserling. He was still a played cleric uh, in one of the, in, um, in, in one of the uh, aristocratic houses. In other words, he had any real value, any real income as such, other than lecturing. So he went on. And then he got to 1721, around about that time, when he thought that would be a good idea if we could get Montague to agree to act as master. And somebody, presumably, decided that was the time now to call them grand master. I'm not going to argue with that. That's OK. OK by me. The problem was that he and most of the speakers today took their eye off the ball. Because at the same time, as Montague was making his place in masonry, so was Wharton. Wharton was a mercurial, completely loose cannon. He was, a, he was as the David Beckham of the day. He was a brilliant guy. Everybody wanted a piece of him. And somebody, for whatever reason, actually encouraged him to become a mason. 
He was a closet Catholic. He he published the Great Britain, which was anti parliamentary and he had parliamentary and he also had all sorts of conflicts with all sorts of other people. He was spending a fortune like there was no tomorrow and he was a real character in the, the system. However, these guys that were organising Grand Lodge were bringing it through. They were gradually evolving a system that would work. And then, all of a sudden, they had to have a, an election for the next grand. Who was going to elect the next grand master? Everything that Walton had touched had turned to, to, to dross. And now he had the election. He was the deputy grand master. He was in charge. And then suddenly they had a vote. And damn it, it was a hung vote. And he had to make the casting vote in 1723. Now there's a horrible saying which it's not all over until the fat lady sings. Now the problem was, it wasn't all over. Because there was Desagulier sitting there and if he'd have let Walton loose on Freemasonry, we would never have recognised it today. They'd got it all worked out. And now there was this... So he decided to go against the convention and actually allow, the, the, not the casting vote to remain, but the, the established situation to remain, but to cast a vote against it. And he took over. Walton got up and stormed out. And now they could actually have a grand lodge that they wanted. Half, half of the people had voted for a closet Catholic, for goodness sake. Desigulier hated Catholics. He had no time for them. He was, a, he was a Newtonian. He believed, actually, in one God who created the world and then left it to establish laws. Even Newton thought that. He was a disciple of Newton. So, in other words, what they did was to introduce... A ritual. Now let's face it, ritual is actually really part of a masonry. And what does that ritual say? Every one of you that have joined masonry have promised on the last day or listened to some guy who's told you to make a daily advancement in Masonic knowledge. To study more especially those of the liberal arts and sciences that's laid within your compass. Point naught nor one of you, I guess, have done it. And uh, they're about the same number. Ratio have bought my book, which illustrates <laughs> it. <laughs> and what's even worse, point naught 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 one, I've actually read it. And, and, and so the, the point is this. We are controlled by the concept of science. Religion up until that point believed in a God you could go up a ladder to. And now we had a situation where we had a God that was, where was he? For goodness sake, Newton had proved it was endless. It didn't work anymore. Okay, <laughs> and now am I going to work anymore? <laughs> so I've given you something to think about, and I think that's worth it. Thank you. Um, Stuart Morgan, um, from the province of Northamptonshire and Huntingdonshire, and a member of the Richard Sandbach Lodge of Research in that province. Uh, unlike the other speakers, I actually didn't come with any pre-prepared notes or with an opinion. Uh, why I came today is I wanted to find what I would call the smoking gun. Um, in other words, uh, when I had a look at the papers, what I was looking for was motivation, cause and effect. Why would people say that it was 1717? Why would people say it was later? And of the various presentations in the papers, the one I found most interesting in terms of answering that question was from uh, Rick Berman, because he gave us the backstory. And the backstory isn't necessarily germane to Freemasonry, speculative Freemasonry in the first instance. It's about the political and social backdrop at the time when these events were taking place. So the question for me is when and who hatched the plan to take what was already speculative Freemasonry unorganized and then create a Grand Lodge, and for what purpose. And it seems to me that the members of the Roman Grapes are well motivated um, to be the people who would want to bring the other three lodges together at that time. And the reason why they wanted to do that 
and conceive that plan, it would seem, is that they, and some of the personalities that appear later would tend to underline this, but they wanted to make sure that they kept a Jacobite dynasty off the throne. So if that was the motivation, when was the conception? It seems to me the conception was not even 1717, but it was a date unknown prior to 1717, and that 1717 was a date on the road to the execution of a final end. So if there's con conception and gestation and birth, it then says to me that I think that the members who hatched that plan probably felt that they had achieved their ambition in 1721, and that the Constitution, Anderson's Constitution, was probably a consolidation of that position which made the constitution of speculative Freemasonry official, and it would be official around being what they had conceived in the first instance. And they had conceived it to be Calvinist or Presbyterian or certainly a Huguenot in nature, supporting Charles I and his dynasty. But there are some people in this story who I feel... Um, haven't been properly maybe represented. Uh, there are some what I would call dogs that haven't yet barked. One of the things I want to ask, so I'm going to leave some questions here today rather than present a position and then answer it. The question I would ask was, what was the plan for role, therefore, of speculative Freemasonry? Were they to be nothing more than a lobby group? Or were they to be a prime mover? in the political and social developments at that time. If they were a lobby group, perhaps the members at that time were thinking, we need a safe place to go, to, to feast, to dine, and to exercise our beliefs. Basically, rest and relaxation for men who were working in a very tumultuous society. Or were they the fifth column? Were they setting the agenda? Were they the prime movers? Were they pulling the strings? So this is where I come to ask some questions about some of the names that we've heard of today. First of all, the second Duke of Montague. We've heard that he had to be persuaded by the Duke of Richmond, George Penn, and Desigelier. Maybe. But then, let's think about his background for a moment. The first Duke, his father, had been ambassador to France. And when he came back from France... Um, he came back with strong Huguenotic sympathies, so much so that we heard today that his son was tutored by Huguenots. He also brought over Huguenot craftsmen to build his house in Boughton, which happens to be in my province, just outside Kettering, on the road to Geddington. And in fact, it's called uh, the Little Versailles, because it was modelled on what he had seen during his time in France. So he was, a, to the core, Huguenot sympathiser, and I think he brought up his son the same. So I asked, was it really necessary to convince Montague? Because obviously he was going into that conversation very sympathetic to the cause. The question associated with that one then would be, why did they want to uh, persuade somebody like Montague? Was he to be the figurehead? Why wouldn't Richmond do that himself? Or actually any member within the, uh, the uh, Roman grapes who had those sympathies, who were titled, he wasn't, Montague wasn't the only one. Why him, and why did he say yes to it? The reason is, I'm asking, is because it was a poison chalice. It was at a time when there was huge uh, insurrection going on uh, around the, uh, the, the change of uh, royal dynasty. And I'll come on to that in a moment, too. Um, because I had then to ask, why was Montague's tenure so short? You would think at the time they would be celebrating their victory at 1721. And yet Wharton was a staunch Jacobite sympathiser. And in fact, we heard uh, in one of the papers earlier on that uh, Atterby was um, supported by him. He sponsored Atterby. And when Atterby was uh, later um, told to leave the country, exiled, um, Wharton made a very big show of presenting him with a sword and bidding him farewell in a very public way. So did the Jacobites then think, right, we now need to respond to what's been going on under Montague? And they bumped him. And they bumped him very quickly. Who was behind that? And how did it manage to come about? You would have thought that the people who had started the process would have made sure that the Jacobites would never have threatened what they had then created. But they did. But then Wharton 
was not long in the role, and it was by one vote when he was then, when he lost that vote, we heard about that from the last speaker, sorry, the one but last speaker, um, and Wharton then left in a huff. In other words, the Jacobite response to this had failed at that point, but it was a damn close run thing. It was 43 to 42 votes, as I recall. So, in all of this, there is this shadowy figure, which we've heard about. And again, another Huguenot, Charles Delafray, the spy master. I wonder what his role really was in all of this. I think what we've got then, in my mind, is the smoking gun question. Was this the prime mover? Everything we've talked about today, was this the prime mover in a dynastic shift and a consolidation of royal power into the hands of Charles I and his successors? Or was it a place to go for these gentlemen to talk, plan and plot, but maybe not to execute? Did that happen elsewhere? And that actually, for me, says, depending on which it was, how significant, so I'm putting 1717 slightly to one side here, how significant was 1717 in the scheme of things? Maybe in those circumstances, 1717 was vitally important because it started a process. But maybe that process, as far as the plotters were concerned, finished in 1723. I leave that as a hanging question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I said earlier that I thought what I hope would come out of today is that we would come away with questions. Um, and I, I hope also that we would come away with questions that would inform this research as we take it forward into the early history of Grand Lords. So I'm grateful to you all, and I'm sure we'll hear more afterwards um, for your comments, which have indeed prompted uh, very uh, many questions. And I, it's going to be difficult for me to cover everything uh, in, a, in an off-the-cuff um, response. Um, uh, but... Um, I think the way I uh, uh, the, the the first uh, question I think I would would uh, focus on is in the issues of motivation um, uh, uh, around uh, 1721 and particularly this issue of could Freemasonry have been created so suddenly um, if so what was its purpose. And um, I, again, I think I would refer immediately back to a remarkable article which I would urge everybody to try and get hold of. And maybe it might be worth contemplating reprinting it in our proceedings by Aubrey's former student, Andrew Hanway, um, on the creation of the Order of the Bath. <coughs> Hannum, um, Hannum, uh, on the creation of the Order of the Bath um, in 1725 which was done very quickly, very suddenly, at the initiative of the Duke of Montague. It was something that was driven by Montague and that Montague wanted to happen because, as Rick explained, um, Montague was very much a supporter of the Hanoverian dynasty, uh, was interested in building institutions that would help support that. Um, and it was something that he drove forward. And the parallels between the two events are, are really rather astonishing. And if I was asked kind of who was taking things forward in 1721, uh, uh, the role of Payne in implementing that, the role of Desaguliers with his advice was undoubtedly very important. But I would argue in the light of Andrew's article uh, that we should be looking at Montague as probably somebody who drove it forward himself. There's no evidence of the uh, Duke of Richmond persuading Montague or Desaguliers. I mean, we have no evidence at all of that. And in fact, the Duke of Richmond didn't attend the Duke of Montague's installation. So he can't have been atten uh, attempting very hard um, to actually, actually take him forward. So I would be inclined uh, for 1721 uh, to look very much at Montague as somebody driving it forward um, as a, a court initiative. And um, in putting that forward, John has made the very pertinent point. Well, how if we accept Stuckley's comment that they were short of Freemasons at the beginning of the year, somebody must have been working very hard to fill Stationers Hall with Freemasons uh, by June. 
To which the answer is, we know who was there, and they mostly weren't Freemasons. This is another indication that something was being created. If Grand Lodge had existed in some kind of organised form beforehand, um, I think they would have been much stricter about the initiations. But figures who both the Antiquity Mini and Stockley record as attending, um, such as the Duke of Wharton, Sir George Oxenden, Sir Robert Rich, and a number of others, are recorded in the press as being initiated later in the lodge at the Queen's Arm Tavern uh, at St Paul. Now, they wouldn't be attending um, a, an event that's already a formal meeting of, of the Grand Lodge, in my view, but they might be coming to a great public launch of, of a new uh, pro hanoverian initiative um, uh, 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 of, the, uh, uh, of the sort that was to be done on an even larger scale uh, with the Knights of the Bath uh, for four years later. And I very much see Grand Lodge as a sort of dry run for the Knights of the Bath um, in many ways. Um, uh, uh, the question about the reliability of Stookley has loomed um, uh, very large. Um, it's important to emphasise Stookley was very much at the heart of events uh, right the way through from 1721, uh, was very, very influential uh, in Grand Lodge councils um, from that point. Uh, the Commonplace book isn't that much later, and it's not a separate book. Um, if you've worked with Stookley's collections, uh, there are actually kind of lots of different bits of paper, and it's only a few years later, and I think recent scholarship has argued against the idea that he became in any way disillusioned. But I think the other key factor, which one of the speakers has alluded to here, that I would also emphasise, is the role of the Duke of Wharton, which I think is very central uh, here. The Duke of Wharton attended uh, uh, that uh, installation of the Duke of Montague in 1721. The Duke of Richmond didn't. And we've heard a lot about, about the Duke of Wharton. That's, that's very key and very important in understanding. There's a, one final thing I, th I could say more about Sayer, and I think I, if, if you go back to the Cambridge paper, historians make arguments, but historians don't present facts, so we do make arguments. But what we're doing there is suggesting that if you look at Sayer in particular, you could see that he's increasingly chancing his arm in claiming to have been the Grand Master as the years go by. The first references we've got to him in Grand Lodge records, there's no reference to him being a uh, Grand Master. It only appears when they're really tightening up um, uh, the charitable provision um, and increasingly imposing claims have to be made in order to get anything back. And says a very interesting point there. We've got the references uh, in the Cambridge paper. My final political point, I think, is that we mustn't just think about what was going on in 1717 to 1721. We must think about what was happening in 1738 when Anderson wrote this account. When, at that point, um, Desagulia in particular seems to have been very influential in trying to uh, uh, align the Grand Lodge uh, with Frederick Lewis, Prince of Wales, who, of course, was initiated uh, as a Freemason. The 1738 Constitution is dedicated to Frederick Lewis and it was presented to him at the very time, the very point where Frederick Lewis was heading up the opposition to George II. It's a bit like if you dedicated the Book of Constitutions to Boris Johnson. Uh, you're making a very clear political point. And Anderson's narrative is shaped as much by what's going on there, the opposition forming around Walpole, as it is by what's going on earlier. And the involvement of the Duke of Walton indicates that the cross-currents that we need to think about politically in thinking about the context of these narratives are, are, are complex and they're not a simple weak narrative, although that one is a very important one. So that's some of the points that occurred to me. I'll pass over to... Uh, Pass over to John, who's probably equally got his mind racing with various possibilities. Um, I have to say I've been very impressed <clears throat> this afternoon. Sorry, I'm, I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, <clears throat> somebody said to me when this was first advertised, oh, it's going to be a very short and probably sterile debate. Um, I didn't think it would be. Um, 
I also have to stay right at the outside. I don't think my mind's been changed in any way by anything that's been said um, this afternoon. Um, I think it's slightly disingenuous, Andrew, um, to compare the origin of Grand Lodge with the origin of the Order of the Bath. Um, the Grand Lodge was formed, if we can uh, say, but because one of the biggest problems, of course, that we have with this whole thing is we don't know who was involved. There are no membership lists. We have no idea. But the general impression seems to be that the original four lodges in 1717 were basically um, what uh, we would call artisan or working class groups. Um, they were feeling their way towards something. The thing with the Order of the Bath was it was done for political reasons by very high-powered people who were moving very quickly and had the ability. Um, I, I stick by what <clears throat> I said in, in my paper, the, the, the slow gestation from the Grand Feast um, and uh, moving to actually becoming a Grand Lodge. And I would agree 1721 is key, um, 1723 even more with the publication of Anderson's Constitutions, which became the Masonic text for um, certainly um, most other Grand Lodges that came on in the 18th century, um, although the Europeans moved off in another direction, but certainly for um, the United States of America um, and the American Grand Lodges, it, it um, and uh, its plagiarism, Hyman Raisin by Lawrence Dermott, um, were key Masonic documents. And indeed, today, wearing my present professional hat in this building, uh, dealing with foreign relations, uh, we constantly get reminded by certain groups in Europe uh, that they work to the constitutions as set down by Anderson in 1723. Um, as I said at the start of my talk, and as, as you said in both Cambridge and here, um, we do need to look at things. Um, things have been brought out today, I think dealing more with what happened after the Grand Lodge was formed um, and, and its direction um, in the 1720s. Uh, but it is the essence of what Quattro Coronati Lodge is about, <coughs> is to look, to re-examine, and to have this sort of symposium to see what uh, we can bring forth. And that has to be good. Um, as, as a final comment, um, it was said by Aubrey right at the start, we won't make any decision today. Uh, thank God for that, because what would we all do with our spare time if we solved the problem? <laughs> Can I quickly call upon the honorary editor of QC to me as work a house notice? <laughs> Can I make a plea that there is sent to me every single paper that we have heard today in its final iteration as soon as possible and certainly by the end of March. And this can also include any extra contributions uh, that Aubrey mentioned at the start. If you write to editor at quatuacoronati.com, I think that's the right address, um, then I'll be very, very grateful because it does take quite a long time to get all this stuff properly put together and proofread and so on. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>